George is going to come up in a few minutes to read our passage, and, and, but before he does that, one of the things that we've been uh, trying to do a little more regularly is, is have me not talk, not just in you know, having other people come up and give sermons, but, but there are other people here, and, and I think one of the, the things that we wrestle with in, in, in the modern Western church is that uh, we've kind of lost some of what we see, a little bit too steep of a triangle of like what uh, and, and who is important. I mean, we got to remember that we're priesthood of believers, and so when we go out, like this is this is not like, like preaching is not the high point of 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 the Christian life, right? Because some people are like, I would, I never want to talk in front of any, anybody ever, right? And that doesn't make them less important in the kingdom of God. We all have have specific gifts and talents that we're to steward and use well. Benjamin talked about this a little bit last week. And so one of the key phrases and the things I really enjoy, and we're going to highlight a little bit today in, in our passage from Hebrews, is the phrase designer and builder. It's talking about God. Um, and so one of the things that, that, that we've, um, so yeah, so like Katie's been working with people about doing specific stories, then I also want to highlight areas where uh, the scripture is speaking about things that we do things that kind of touch our everyday life, things that, that we can intersect and we can even affirm in people who don't know the Lord to say, hey, look, there's this thing that God is about that you're also very about. Why do you think that is? And we can start to connect that. Um, and so people can, can begin to understand and kind of see the Lord a little more clearly. So if you design or build things, and I will start calling people out by name if you don't make your way up to this stage, I would love for you to come up here. Um, I just want anybody, if you design or build things, and uh, so if that means if you are an engineer, if you work with your hands, if you put a shovel to the dirt, if you are on a keyboard making things appear, um, if you design and build things, if you custom make fishing rods, Chuck Mills. And uh, I'm going to get this microphone and hopefully it reaches to everybody. Oh, yeah, good call. Thank you. So what I want you all to do, and we might have to kind of squeeze in. I don't know how far that, that cable is going to reach. Um, but uh, I just want you to introduce yourselves and say what you design or build. I, uh -oh. I'm going to call you out, Jim Johnson. I know you. I know you design and build things. Get up here. <laughs> you got sent to Arkansas to take apart and br bring something back together. <laughs> if anybody knows Jim, Jim loves being the center of attention. He loves it <laughs> when he's talked about in front of a lot of people. And I'm going to get a lot of grief about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, uh, Liz, you work next to my wife. I've seen the things that you draw. You can come on up here. That's, I'm going to keep, I mean, until, like, Brennan Construction, I'd say that. That's design and build. I, yeah, right. Every time I call you, you're on your way to a job. Get on up here. Anybody else? I think we got everybody. Everybody that I know of, anyway. Awesome. Well, just wherever the microphone is, just, uh, yeah, just introduce, just, Name and then what you what you design or build. Good morning. I'm Darla Gonzer, and my husband and I moved here about six months ago from Fargo because he has wanted to live in the lakes area his whole life. So I told him, I says, well, if we don't go now, we're running out of time. <laughs> N none of us know if we have tomorrow, right? Well, anyway, my husband and I, we make homemade cold process soap. That's soap with, with uh, moisturizing butters and oils. There's no chemicals in it. It's made the old-fashioned way with lye, which is sodium hydroxide. My husband has wanted to do this pretty much since he was 15. He was, on, he was waiting on a yes from me. Finally, about... I have to cut my story short, but finally about five, a year, five years ago, the time was right, and I said, okay, let's make soap. And we've had a blast doing it, and we love to share it with people, and your skin will love you for it. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Chuck Mills, and I used to build custom fishing rods, but I actually still do it a little bit on the side. I had a business for about eight years and got tired of working for people with my hobby, so I quit. I'm Chad Katzenberger. I'm a civil engineer and primarily design uh, infrastructure, public infrastructure, mostly drinking water related. So, I'm Oliver Kaufness and I build bikes at Sickle Bike Shop and I make a bunch of other stuff at my house. I'm Andrew Toffness and I build cabinetry. I'm Katie Johnson, and Andrew built my kitchen, and I painted it. So I paint walls, I paint rocks. This week I was landscaping my front yard, and um, I do a little sewing with odds and ends. Uh, I'm P.J. Brennan, and I used to build houses and remodel houses. I'm Matt Young, and I rebuild damaged houses. I'm Eric Schiller. I'm a civil engineer and project manager, and I work with teams uh, at MnDOT, uh, Department of Transportation, to build uh, roads and bridges. I'm Caleb Cruzy. I'm a mechanical engineer. Um, I work at Graphic Packaging, doing mostly plastic replacement with paperboard and pl cardboards. I'm Gretchen Hinchley, and during the week, I'm a medical device engineer, and then on the weekends, we get to have fun playing with bikes at the bike shop. I'm Luke Lundquist. I design med devices and work on aerospace projects and uh, get to work on bikes on the weekend. I'm Jim Johnson, and I'm currently a millwright with Crowing Recycling, and I maintain, put together, and sometimes tear apart recycling equipment. I'm Liz Toffness, and I work at the cabinet shop and uh, install drawers. <laughs> I'm Christy Tobin, and my husband and I like to joke that I work in the internet mines because I design <laughs> websites for a living and uh, also do graphic design. I'm Nick Hoffman, and I'm a landscape designer at Copper Creek Landscaping and also a graphic designer. I'm Scott Hoffman, and I design golf courses. Actually, God designs them. I just wave my arms around a lot. <laughs> I'm Megan Gary, and I do kitchen design with Andrew and Liz. And I'm Mike Gary, and I get to build bicycles with easy riders once in a while. And that's pretty fun, too. Um, what you do is wildly important. Uh, work is not a part of the fall. We see that in, in the ideal world, in the garden, there was work to be done. And, in, and there was design, and there was build. And if you think about working... Um, and if you look at that type of work, there's there's planning, there's engineering that goes into that. There's aesthetic beauty that goes into that. There's functionality that goes into that. And that's reflected in the various types of work that you all do. So when you go about your work, uh, you get to participate in what the Lord is doing and display uh, and an, an, an give, give the world around you an idea about who God is and to talk to them about, about how the Lord works and, and to show people and kind of clarify further who God is and, and what he's doing. So thank you for that. And so if we would all just pray with me as we pray for these folks, Lord, we thank you for designers and builders. We wouldn't have roads. We wouldn't have water that goes where it's to go. We wouldn't have waste that goes where it's supposed to go. We wouldn't have enjoyable things like bicycles and golf courses and websites that help us to learn, that inform us, that inspire us. Wouldn't have devices that, that save our lives, that bring us places. 
Help us to enjoy your beauty. That's where we thank you for these men and women. We pray that our work and our vocation would show the world more about who you are. Amen. All right, at this time, we're going to continue our way through Hebrews 11. So if you uh, just kind of catch us all up, and, and as you've seen over the last few weeks, we've been talking, uh, we kinda, we've gotten through he, the first 10 chapters of Hebrews where the author is just going to over and over again, just like anything you think is great, Jesus is greater. Everything you think is great, Jesus is greater. Everything that you think is awesome, Jesus is, is awesome. And it, it's all, it's it, micro machines, anybody? Anybody remember micro machines? Anyone remember build models? You know, and they'd always have the thing on there about like what the scale is. The author of Hebrews is like, whatever you think, infinity. That's the scale. Whatever you think is awesome, Jesus is awesomer infinity times. Or like when you ever get into a debate with, with somebody, you know, remember on the playground when you were, when you were younger, or maybe some of you are still participating in this game, like, yeah, well, I'm, I'm one times better. I'm, two, I'm a billion times better. Bam! I'm going to up the scale to an inconceivable amount. That's what the author of Hebrews is trying to do. And now for the rest of the time, he's going to say, okay. And as a result of, of how awesome God is, here's what reality looks like. As a result of how awesome God is, this is, this is what we're going to look at. And, and so right now in Hebrews 11, the author is just bringing us through and bringing us a couple different examples that are all going to culminate in Hebrews 12 uh, with Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk a little, about, a little more about who God the Father is today, and we're going to look at how that pertains to identity uh, over the next couple weeks and how that informs what happens in light of suffering and what that looks like for the Christian life and things that may be happening that we shouldn't be especially surprised about and should kind of be on the look for. Uh, so before I uh, talk all the rest of the day, let's get George up here. He's going to read to us from Hebrews chapter 11. If you have a paper Bible, feel free to pull that out. If you have a mobile device, follow along there. If neither of those are available or preferable, the words will be on the screen behind us. So George, whenever you are ready. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. I touched a wrong part of my screen and everything moved. start here again. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. 
By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even when she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore, from one man, and him as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven, and as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel, and the prophets who, through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect.
Thanks, George. Lord, we are always thankful that we're able to gather together and to read from your word. We pray for the the folks around the the world where where this is not legal. Think of my friend Abraham under house arrest, serving in China. Lord, may we not take for granted what we have here. May we continue to look to you to be delighted and to walk in faith. Amen. All right. Kids, you have been so patient this morning. You can head on out this direction. Try to keep up with Henry and Meredith. And Lord, we thank you for Willa and Ellis and Elsie and Margaret and Eleanor and man, the backs of the heads are getting tough. Uh, Winston and Viv. Thanks, Margo. Uh, for Lily, for Ava, for George, for Oliver, for uh, for Izzy, for all the other kids that I missed. Lord, we thank you that we are your children. And we pray that we would exemplify what it is to follow you, that we would show reality to these kids, your reality, a true reality that we're moving toward. Amen. Um, I grew up in the 80s, which means that uh, I was very excited a few years ago when I learned that Top Gun 2 was coming out. Uh, conservative estimate, probably watched the original one in excess of 300 times as a young person. Uh, it was just on repeat at the household. Um, my dad used to take me to air shows, so I've seen the Blue Angels a handful of times. I wanted to be a fighter pilot for a little while. Um, my love for motorcycles came from uh, Tom Cruise's original 1986 Honda, or excuse me, Kawasaki Ninja 900 that was featured in the original film. So this last week, I did see Top Gun Maverick, not once, but twice. It was awesome. I loved it. Growing up, I had had a model of, of, I didn't have the F-14, but I had uh, the F-18 that the Blue Angels flew, and and it was just fun to like think about that and imagine flying around in that, Um, as was alluded to previously, uh, Megan, and if you saw uh, any of Megan's videos online, we took a trip. We were gone for two weeks. We took a big airplane. Um, It was the model that I had. Could that do what the big jet that carried us across the ocean did? No, right? Um, and, 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 and as as great as the cameras and the cinematography were in 1986 and again in 2022, is, is watching Top Gun the same as being a Top Gun fighter pilot? No, right? Like there's nothing, I mean, that rush of, I mean, I can't imagine like 10 Gs of pressure bearing down on him and weighing 2,000 pounds sounds incredible to me. Right, but that's, that's all out there. And, and that's and so what 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 the author of Hebrews is is trying to wake us up to to get us to see uh, and, and throughout the using kind of the, this this Hebrew language of of using you know models throughout and we're going to see this in this passage right I mean, what was what was the ark what was the tabernacle what was the temple all these things were were gradually expanding things that, w- that existed to be a metaphor on and on and on to to wake. Uh, not only the, the people of Israel, but, but for them to show all of the world that you're participating in this ever-expanding, ever-growing kingdom that seeks to invite more and more people in, that there's a, a divine reality that's, that, that, that we see kind of dimly every single day. So say, take off the blinders, and he's inviting us to come in. And, and, and the author is saying, step toward God by faith. Step toward God by faith. And so, and, the, and an author, as Lonnie pointed out, is kind of using this, this kind of Hebrew language, uh, not, not a trick, but a, a thing. I don't know what the, what the noun is for that. Ask Lonnie. Um, and uh, 
And so it continues to ramp up these stories about God's faithfulness. They're just going chronologically through and highlighting these different things. And it isn't to say, hey, be like this person, do this, but it's all to say, hey, look at this that this person did and see how that points to Jesus. And so as we follow along and as we're discipled by people, it's less about, oh, it's not, oh, I want to be like, no, I want to be like Abraham. I want to be like Enoch. I want to be like Abel. No, I want to be like Jesus. And these will just show and highlight some things that are all encompassed in who Jesus is. So let's get into the story. I want to highlight a few different things and then talk about what that looks like to walk this out. Um, so starting, we're just going to go verse 7 to, uh, to verse 12. So if you're like, man, that was, uh, there was a lot of by-faiths in there. There's a lot of ground to cover. Yeah, we're going to take chapter 11 in, in chunks. So uh, 7 through 12. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear. Now, this is something that um, I think, especially as, as Western world evangelicals, we kind of wrestle with, right? Because uh, we're, we're told, uh, you know, don't be afraid, 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 don't be afraid. But, but no, Mo, Noah was responding in reverent fear. Like, well, what is this look? Look like and i think the best description that i've heard for this i actually preached a very horrible sermon on this like 15 years ago on what fear was and i was like i can't quite like it's one of those things that's definitely more uh like perceived and felt and experienced than it is explained but i think the best explanation i've ever heard is it's like being in the presence of a lion looking at it and saying this thing is awesome i hope it doesn't kill me and and, and so no and in reverent fear so seeing this this is awesome i hope it doesn't kill me and, and so, and, and so it's, it's more than, than mere respect, but it's, it's kind of being brought into this reality and a, and a firm understanding of who's in charge. Uh, designers and builders, anybody ever worked with a chainsaw? What happens when you don't have reverent fear for the chainsaw? Anybody had to take anybody else or gone to the hospital themselves for that? Yeah, that makes a mess right? What happens when you don't have, have a reverent fear for, for things that are bigger and more powerful? Bad things happen, right? And, and so, so the author is, it's, it's not a, be fearful because God is vindictive, but, but be fearful because God is, God is good and he's inviting us into this reality. Because God's big, because there are ramifications. Because it, it, when, when we don't follow the Lord, there are consequences to this. And so Noah is, and so the author of Hebrews is going to use Noah to, to highlight this. It says, by faith, Noah being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. So Noah and the Lord are having a conversation. If you're not familiar with this, uh, Genesis 6 through 8 kind of highlights the, the flood account um, and, and some of this conversation. So the Lord and Noah are, are having a conversation. And I, mean, I just love, like, how awesome is God? He's like, I'm going to show you how great I am. And so what could, what could if you wanted to like flood the earth, maybe you'd want to go and look for somebody to live by the sea, right? And be like, oh, you build boats. You're one of the great build, like the best boat builders. I'm going to, why don't you do this? What does God do? He approaches this dude out in the desert and says, hey, why don't you build a boat? <laughs> like, can you imagine Noah? Just like, mm, fill me in, God. <laughs> What's a boat? Why would I need it? And why does it have to be so big? Like, I haven't seen a puddle that big since I spit out my morning coffee, right? I mean, it's just like there's nothing... What? And yet the Lord's like, no, I'm going to take this person that has no business building a boat. I'm going to build a huge boat in a place that has no business. Like, there's no dock around. There's no shipyard. But yet they build this boat in the middle of the desert. And, and in doing so, Noah, we see that Noah lays aside the ordinary to obey God. He's like, yeah, life is, life is I'm, I'm doing okay. Like there, it wasn't like Noah was, was, I mean, Noah was like a decent, like, yeah, you know, just kind of like an average dude. Like he's doing his thing, right? And Lord's like, um, I'm going to need you to do something a little bit different. And he's like, all right. So he builds this boat. So he constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Uh, a little bit about that phraseology. By this, he condemned the world. 
Have you ever been around uh, somebody who you're just like, like you think you're doing okay, and then you get around that person, you're like, that's what it's like to be a person. That's what it's like to be a man or a woman. That's what it's like to walk in faith. You ever have like people like that where like you think that like things are going okay, but like whenever you're in their presence, like they they just not not even directly, but just by the the sheer quality of their character and how they live their life, you're like, man, I got a ways to go. Anybody else like that? I've got a couple friends where every time I'm with them, I'm just like, oh yeah, like that that's it. Yes, okay. And it's they don't even say anything. We'll just be out like, you know, building something. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay, that's that's how I need to live my life. And that's what Noah is doing here. And so it isn't that, that Noah is getting up while he's constructing the ark, you know, up there putting on the top and making the big floating temple and just being like, oh, you silly people down there. He isn't condescending to the people. How does he condemn the world? He just lives in obedience to God. He just lets the world keep doing its thing. The world was, was disrespecting the Lord and moving away from the Lord. Affections turned inward on themselves. And Noah says, all right, Lord, wherever and whatever. Boat in the sand? Sure. Let's do it. And so by, by laying aside the ordinary and having a, a consistent obedience to the Lord, thus condemns the world by showing them a, a deeper, rea- a true reality of what life is is to look like. Um, So, moving on. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive an inheritance. So we see, where does Noah move? Where where does God call Noah to go? Nowhere. He says, stay right where you're at, build a boat. It's going to rain a bunch, then you're going to travel around a little bit. That's kind of how the ocean works. So on the flip side now, we've got Abraham. Abraham's hanging out, doing his thing, living in his tent. And God says, hey, pack up the tent, head that way. Where are you going? Where are you taking me, Lord? Just go. Just take off. And and so Abraham has this very patient, and so we see this very patient view that Abraham has. He's going, you want me to go this way? All right, sure. And ever, ever like started, anybody ever uh, started a, 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 gone on a, on a trip where you couldn't see the destination? Like most of us, right? Like I can't see, I live very close to here, but I can't see this church building from my house. Um, but you, you, like you just got to start, right? Or maybe the first time you went somewhere, anybody like ever driven to the mountains? Like you don't see the mountains, especially if you, like you're going to Colorado. Like you, you get into Colorado, you're like, yeah, I want to see the mountains. What do you see? <laughs> the Eastern Plains. <laughs> Nebraska continued. You get to Fort Morgan, you're like, oh, mate, nope. And then you get to the edge, you're like, oh, are those clouds? You're like, oh, those are four teeners. Those are snow capped mountains. We're getting close. Right? But like, you didn't know that along the way. By faith, we go. And so that's what the Lord has invited the people to say, okay. And so what he's doing with Abraham, he said, okay, you're just going to go. And so. And, and, and Abraham went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in that land of promise, as in a foreign land. So foreign land is just something strange, something, it's a place that he'd never gone. And remember, we live in a, in a fairly transient society. Um, I think 50 years ago, it was said that most people would die within 50 miles of where they grew up. How many of you live at least 50 miles from where you were born? Some of us, right, I mean, it's like we, like, Brainerd our whole lives, Right, and some of us, I mean, we've traveled around a bit. Anybody ever lived further than 50 miles from where they grew up, even if for a short period, right? So, like, that's a pretty, like, that's, that's getting someplace. Okay, how many of us drove to that place? Okay, now imagine walking to that place. Would you be a little bit, like, if you had to, if you had to pack up all of your animals in your house, like your tent, your everything, and, and go, like, how many of us would be as, as inclined to go, right? Like, ever moved? Is that easy? That's difficult, right? Like, not only do you have to pack up the U-Haul, but you have to say goodbye to people, right? Like, there's a support network. Everybody ever moved any place? Like, I know when you, if you moved to, like, I, I worked in um, kind of, like, in hospitality and did some things where, like, you would move and you'd be with people that were also in that similar stage. And so you kind of make friends easily. Um, how many of, or maybe you, we've moved because of, uh, you know, we've been placed by a job and so you kind of have immediate thing. Have you ever just, like, moved someplace and then not had any sort of connection to anybody? 
Yeah, how's that? That's not awesome, right? But, you know, in, in our day, you can at least, like, write a letter, call home, FaceTime, something to ease that. Imagine being Abraham. There's hardly written language at that point in time. There's no FaceTime. Like, he's going. And that means a complete severing of, of all the, the ways that he's been supported. Everything that's, that's given him what he has is gone. And so by faith, he steps out and goes. He has a a vision for what could be and and what is there. And so, and then in living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, and so the author is kind of using these tools to just show kind of the the faithfulness throughout the generation and and just the the ever-expanding kingdom of God, heirs of the same promise. And so there's there's this promise that the Lord has given us, right? And he talks about the promise of his presence, the promise of land, and the promise of an ever-expanding kingdom. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations. Uh, my designers and builders out there, um, if there is a tornado, is it better to be um, in a house or in a tent? Not rhetorical. Obvious, but not rhetorical. Where would you rather be? House, right? Why? It's stronger. There's a foundation, right? Like when you're in a tent, what's the foundation? You. You. You are, the t- you are the foundation. And if you are in a tent and a, f- and, a, and a tornado comes by, what are you? You are a sail. Right? But if you're in a home and there's concrete block below grade and you can get down somewhere, what, what do you have? You have security. You have, you have, you have a, ch- you have a chance to make it, right? And so... And so the, the author of Hebrews is, is helping us to see that there's a foundation, that there's something more to this life, something more for Abraham. And so he's calling him out and says, you're going to go to the city toward, uh, toward the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God, not man. Not our systems. Not structure. Not some sort of self-help. But the designer and builder is God. So he's showing us that, that God is trustworthy. That God has a design, that he's constructed, he's built, and there's, there's a purpose, right? When, when you who draw and, and you create something that's going to be built, right? You don't just draw a line for, for just haphazard sake, right? Like, oh, we'll just stick this thing out right there. There's purpose. There's meaning. There's intent. There's plan. There's a, there's a picture of what is going to come to fruition. And that's what, what, what the Lord is inviting Abraham into. And so we see, in, in, in if, if in Noah, we see that he's laying aside the ordinary. Uh, in Abraham, we see this need for the patient view. And we get to Sarah. It's such a great story. Notice, notice the movement. Two verses of Scripture. Notice, notice where Sarah starts and where Sarah ends. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive even when she was past the age since she was considered faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man, he as good as dead, were born descendants as many as the stars of heaven and many as, innumerable, as, as many as the innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. So anyway, if, you're from, if you're not familiar with the story of Sarah, Sarah is old. Like, can't have kids anymore. Not Like, it wasn't a fertility, like, just old. Past the age and and in that time and in that culture that was a really big deal right because you, you're supposed to pass things on uh, and, and, and so like there's a lot of shame with that but we see that, that all of a sudden by faith she goes from no there's no way that this could happen to believing in the impossible because because she has kids and there's, there's lots of kids. And, and there's multiple descendants all the way on down. And it's this ever-increasing kingdom and that's not built on, on man's ability and man's power. Why? Because her husband's as good as dead. It says so right here. He's like, no, there's, there's no, like, neither one of them are able physically to have kids. And the Lord redeems that, works through that. 
And so we see that, that Sarah shows the extraordinary. And so we see in, in all these, there's this, this constant invitation that it kind of butts us up against and shows us that, that we as people have this, this propensity, this tendency to limit the power of God, to not believe fully in the power of God, to not trust in the power of God, to somehow believe that there are limitations to the power of God. And yet we see examples like Noah that says, yeah, boat in the desert, sure, why not? Great plan. We see Abraham going, yeah, go somewhere. Pack up, pack up everything. Like, there wasn't a moving service. That service didn't, like, nobody would have thought to ever move. And yet Abraham packs up and goes. And the Lord says to Sarah, you are going to be the mother of a great nation. And she's like, I don't know if you've seen me or my geriatric husband, but like we've been qualifying for AARP for a long time. And the Lord says, don't let your great weakness somehow be some sort of stumbling point for me to show my great strength. So what is it that you're showing? Step forward by faith. Step toward God by faith. Builder, designer, our awesome father. He knows his children. He knows what he needs, and he knows how to display his glory in and through us and in and through you as an individual. I love, too, like, what do we see? We see a boat, and we see a tent. Regardless of whether you are, like, what does that mean? Like, all the world. If you want to break the globe down into two things, you get land and water, right? It's one of the first parts of creation. And in the midst of that, God is going to show everyone. So like in Noah, creates this big floating ark. Abraham, as, and which these people are going to carry around this temple, it's, it's going to be this ever-expanding kingdom. And all of them, he's driving toward a point. There's a destination and an intention and a design and a build to history. He's moving them toward the heavenly kingdom. And so, so whether you come by land, by air, or by sea, you are coming to the heavenly home. Four gifts from God that we see in this. God is active. So we see one uh, first gift, the, the call of God. This is a gift. Lonnie spoke about last week that there are people who are, they're called deists, right? They believe that in God in the kind of this cognitive sense. They believe in the idea of God that we can have some sort of like moral idea. But there's no interaction. They, 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 you know, if, if, if the world were a top, they believe that you know, we kind of wound it up, spun it, and are disengaged. We see here that the God of Scripture, that Yahweh is a God who is actively involved with his people, is participating in their lives, and so he's called and he's active. Second gift is God's righteousness. We show the world reality. Right? These, these people that were, they're, and, and isn't that we go around condemning, we just, you just live a better life. Right, like you live away the light that, that the Lord had intended you to live. You, you live obediently to the Lord. And people are going to ask questions. A friend of mine used to always say, live a life that demands an explanation. And when asked, be ready to give it. Because when you live a life that is, that is just, whether it's ordinary or extraordinary, obediently, obedient to God, people are going to notice. People are going to ask questions. They're going to wonder, why is it that you live the way that you live? Now you have the opportunity of a captive audience. Third gift from God, of call, righteousness, design. There's, a, like, there, there's an intent and there's a purpose that the Lord is inviting us into. Fourth gift, promise of his presence. And this is where our faith lies. He's not just calling us to just go out on some whim and just, oh, I, I believe by, by, you know, because I've got some sort of feeling within me or, or I, I've seen some talent or it's happened before. But no, we're participating in what the Lord is inviting us into. And when we don't do this, we often end up discouraged and hopeless, relying helplessly on ourselves, never known and never loved. So what do we do as a result? In all these people, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to see that faith should look like a badge displaying our primary identity. Right? Before you're a, a designer, a builder, before you're a sibling, to be a dad, a couple weeks ago a mom, before you're any of that, if you're in Christ, you were a son, you're a daughter, and that's your primary identity. Not because of what you've done, but by faith. 
And so when we see this, how does this begin to change the way that we live life? We see that the way that these, these people live, in, in o- they obey the odd. Radical obedience comes from radical beliefs. We have a belief in the extraordinary, right? I mean, postmenopausal Sarah. Lord's like, yeah, you're going to have a bunch of kids. Like, really, Lord? I think you maybe skipped physiology. He's like, oh, no, I'm beyond that. Watch me, watch me work. And like Abraham, we have the patience to see the world beyond. And that can be, that can be tricky, right? Like, how do you, how do you reconcile, uh, you know, just obeying and staying where you are like Noah? Or how do you, and, and what does it look like to maybe step out like Abraham and in this undergirded by the belief in the extraordinary like Sarah had? Like, those can be, that can be a tricky line, can it not? And we notice these people were not alone. One, presence of God, and two, they were surrounded by others. And so in the midst of, of our life, let's not do this alone. So a few things to just consider as we, we try to walk this out uh, throughout the week. What do you believe that God has done, and, and what do you believe God will do? And how does this inform who you are and what you do? Said a second way, we all act on faith. You, we all have faith in something. Even if somebody who d- says they don't believe in anything, they have faith in something. Do you act on faith in God or self? Or personally, what's the Lord done in your life? What is the Lord currently doing in your life? I think sometimes we can think, of, oh, the Lord did this thing. Like when I got converted, when I got saved, whatever else, way back. But we, we fail to remember that, that that same Holy Spirit is still alive and in us. And so what is this Holy Spirit doing in your life right now, today? What's the Lord promised to do in your life, and how does that inform what you're doing this week? How do you, dis- how do you see the design and build of God? Man, what would it have been like to be Abraham sitting out there underneath all the stars of the desert, no light pollution, guys are wild. Noah out there on the sea, staring out into the vast nothingness. In 40 days, so you get some like moonlit and some totally black. What what would that have been like? What's it like to be invited in the story where people are going from tents and boats to a heavenly city? Something with no foundation? You want to talk about unsure. Anybody ever surfed before? Can you imagine trying to surf an ark? It's an instability. The Lord is inviting us to a city with firm foundations. And what does obedience in our lives look like? Does it look like change? Does it look like remaining consistent? I mean, who's helping you discern these things? Who's with you on the journey? Who's not just a phone call away, but, but who is right there in the room with you? And if there, there aren't those people, let's, let's work on how do we get some people in the room with us? So when we hear God's voice, we remember, we remind, and we rejoice. Let's remember that we have an awesome Father. Let's remind others to help us see the design and builder that our Father is, and let us rejoice in the fact that our Heavenly Father is present with us as we go out. So continue to pray with me and stand as we sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your design. We thank you for your redeeming work. We thank you that you don't just leave us in the tent, in the middle of the desert. You don't just leave us in the boat, tossed on the seas. You bring us home. You bring us home. To share a meal, to be ever in your presence.